my name is Elisa Morgera, I'm professor of global environmental law at Strathclyde Law School and I co-direct the center together with my colleague Francesco Sindico. We have quite a few members here and we're really pleased and, um, and grateful to our colleague Dr. Saskia Vermeilen uh, to give this exciting talk on outer space and questions related to mining, tourism and settlement. So quite a lot of interesting questions that relate to environmental law, uh, but also to equity issues. Uh, and perhaps in ways they may have come upon us quite more quickly than some of us at least were expecting. I was just telling Saskia earlier today, I mean around 10 years ago I had been invited to an interview with the UN body working on outer space uh, for the legal office. And at the time I thought, well, probably there won't be environmental law to be done there and I decided not to go to the interview. And probably it was really my lack of, <laughs> of foresight, because it seems that not only there's quite a lot of environmental issues uh, that are arising related to our use and understanding of outer space, but there's also quite a lot of activities occurring in outer space that can help us to uh, understand how to intervene in relation to environmental protection, um, to gather information about whether or not our efforts on Earth are making a difference in terms of environmental protection. Uh, and just to say that um, the Strathclyde Center for Environmental Law and Governance, we're um, a growing group of experts working on different aspects of environmental law related to water, corporate accountability, biodiversity. Um, and the area of space is an area where Saskia has already done quite a lot of work, but we, where we are engaging uh, other key partners, such as the European Space Agency and British um, Geological Survey, uh, with a view to furthering our work and being really very much at the forefront of the questions that not only lawyers but actually other experts uh, coming from different perspectives are, are facing and the regulatory questions that are arising there. So without further ado, I'll leave the floor to Saskia who will bring us I think on an amazing journey on her work related to outer space. Uh, there will be time for questions at the end but also if you have a particular interest in this area of research, don't be a stranger. Uh, you'll have our uh, contacts at the end of the presentation and we definitely are here to, to build relationships and to reach out to other um, colleagues, researchers and stakeholders uh, They may wish to continue this voyage with us. So thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Elisa, for this very uh, kind introduction, and thank you very much for the audience to give up such a lovely, uh, sunny evening in Glasgow, which is not that often. So thank you very much for being here. I also would like to thank, before I start my uh, talk, uh, people from Engage, and particularly Joe, for having done an amazing job of uh, organizing all this, but also Miranda from the Centre, and Mara, for all the hard work they've done to get us all here. Okay, so um, to start us off with, um, I think we probably, every day that I read the newspaper, there is something about outer space, and it's either about technology, rockets, uh, rockets being uh, launched, um, it's constantly in the news. Um, and to such an extent that we really start to speak about a new kind of a space age that we going into a whole new territory of, of new resource frontiers with this development of um, going into outer space. And I would like to draw your attention to this particular um, example, which really caught my attention um, a couple of months ago when I was preparing another talk um, on space law. And this is just an example of that you see all sorts of kind of news, some very technical, um, serious kind of news, but sometimes you also read news that you think, is, is this for real, is this science fiction, is this really kind of happening? And this was, was one of the moments when I thought, okay, how do I interpret this, um, this particular announcement? So there is a new nation, uh, a space nation, called um, Asgardia. And it's uh, led by um, the person here on the picture, and he, um, he's been very active in the space industry himself. And the whole idea is that they will form a nation, at the moment it's by, you can uh, register with them. Um, they've got plans that they will, they want to get recognized by the United Nations. And the whole idea is that they really want to protect, in a way, 
this outer space exploration for scientific purposes. Um, and they pride themselves they, that they're writing a constitution at the moment. If you go on their website, you will see that at the moment they've written the main articles of the constitution. The wider public can feed into it, they can give feedback. Uh, so it's quite interesting how, um, how they really treat it as starting anew with, with, with a new uh, nation. And the whole ethic behind um, this space nation is to, um, to think in a very sustainable kind of way where are we going to go in this new um, kind of space, uh, space um, era. Uh, and this is just one, one of, of many different kind of examples uh, we see of, of, of all sorts of new um, developments. And although I will be focusing much more in trying to understand um, space law and where it's coming from, um, I think it's also, just to set the, the, the scene a bit, um, is to link it a little bit to um, why there are um, discussions that are going on in, in different academic disciplines. And uh, particularly in sociology, but also anthropology, they start to engage much more in trying to understand what's, what's going on with, with, with space developments and um, particularly with all these new kind of developments that I just um, um, talked about. And, and that they kind of refer to this, 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 this kind of fascination that we have with outer space. And I think probably most of us who, who came to this talk, it, it just sparks our imagination. Um, and, um, and it sparks the imagination of, of, uh, of people. And what is kind of interesting is if you read, um, if you read for example, further on the website of Asgardia, um, but quite often there is this element of a kind of space frontier and we can really see some kind of parallels when we went into the Wild West, that kind of rhetoric that we were using of going into new, between quotation marks, territory and how we kind of making a homestead, how we're going to conquer, how we're going to colonize, how we're going to get ourselves established. If we look into the kind of all their rhetorics that were used when we were colonizing the Americas, for example, same kind of language is sometimes appearing as well when we talk about outer space uh, developments and particularly when we talk about um, settlements uh, on Mars, um, for example. So there is a really interesting uh, synergy there. So sociologists have kind of studied this phenomenon that we have this fascination of um, taking uh, our society into into the into the wider space in a, in a very literal kind of sense, and um, they call it um, this kind of space frontier as a kind of earth that we want to humanize the cosmos, that we really want to um, plant our flag, um, establish our societies um, in the cosmos. And um, Dickens and Omrod are um, very prolific uh, sociologists working in this area, and they. They explain this phenomenon through th three different fixes. Um, and being um, sociologists, they're kind of critical about some of these developments in, in, in the space uh, frontier. And they say that what, what is kind of happening is that um, capitalist means are kind of fixed from Earth into, into the cosmos. And that's been done through di three different um, fixes. And the first one is through existing um, developments that we're all very familiar with, like for military purposes, satellite technology, that's all very much happening. That's a very well established kind of relationship that we have built between Earth and, and outer space. But that are, and this is where it becomes really exciting, is that there are much more new kind of developments happening Tourism is, is a good example, but also some idealistic. So it's not just maybe for capitalist kind of purposes that we feel that because of resource scarcity, um, environmental issues, pollution, that we might have to go off Earth. But there also might be idealistic issues as well. Um, and one of it is through um, the notion of climate change, uh, huge pollution, that there is this idea that we might have to start geoengineering and that we might uh, be able to establish new settlements on, on Mars through this terraforming by creating environments that are very similar to what we have here. 
But that comes with an ideology that maybe these kind of settlements should, um, also in terms of governance, maybe experiment with something different from what we've been doing, how we've governed Earth, because we made a, a big mess here. And um, uh, Dickens and onwards are kind of arguing that we kind of polluted our own nest, and to the extent that for some it becomes a necessity that we have to go into um, other um, other spaces um, to actually continue our, our civilization. And often that is kind of um, what we see is that these kind of claims, uh, all these different kind of fixes, that um, what is really driving it and, and how we make these claims about um, outer space and, 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 and establishing new settlements or developing tourism, etc. There's also always this notion of property is at the heart of a lot of these debates. And it's a question that, again, um, that a lot of people feel very uncomfortable with if we do ask the question, can we own the moon? Can we own an asteroid? Can we own a piece on the moon? Is that something that we as a society find an acceptable question uh, or not? So that's very much at the heart of my talk is, 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 is questioning, um, can we own it? Can we own the moon? Does it belong to us? Um, yes or no, we will, we will see that later. But also, I think I would also like to open a kind of an ethical uh, question here as well, that we do think that we can own it, but, and if we think we can own it, on, on the, what kind of condition, what kind of governance regime should we establish in order to, to develop um, these, these settlements, mining, etc. Okay, so <coughs> this whole question of, of ownership is something that, that is being debated and, 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 and being discussed at all different kind of, of levels. And I'm going to give three examples where we see um, this, this, um, this very strong language around ownership. And the first is, is around fictional appropriation. It doesn't have any legal meaning behind it, but nevertheless it really sets the tone how some people, particularly entrepreneurs, um, quite often in America, that they do see this opportunity to start claiming ownership over the moon, for example, without any legal um, 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 reality behind it. But just because they think things are happening, we need to be the first to, to, um, to own this, 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 this piece of land. Um, and here are a few examples of this kind of fictional appropriation where people make claims that they own the moon, but um, obviously there is no legal um, claim be, um, behind it. And what is interesting when I was doing this research that we can find the first kind of claim that somebody sort of um, made a suggestion that they were owning the moon was actually by the Prussian Emperor uh, Frederick the Great in um, 1756 when he gave as a very symbolic kind of gesture uh, the moon uh, to uh, a Jürgen who was uh, a soldier and in terms of sort of sort of showing gratitude he said uh, for all the work you've done, for all the battles you fought for me and you've won, I give you uh, the moon. Um, but we see much more recent uh, kind of examples and one which is really very, um, um, you know, some of you might be familiar with, is with the lunar land or the lunar embassy. Uh, where a gentleman called uh, Hope, he parceled um, the moon in three million uh, land plots. And you can buy, he claims, title deeds. He got it registered, he, he wrote the constitution, he got the, 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 the division of the plots registered uh, in California. He also took a copyright on the constitution he wrote, and you can buy for roughly about $30. There's some posters you have to pay, etc., and you get a title deed. And he actually claims that you actually own that particular plot of land on the moon and if there would ever be any mining, you also own the mineral rights over that uh, plot of land. Another really interesting <coughs> example was a Brazilian uh, entrepreneur who also claimed that he owned uh, the moon and that was around the time of the Apollo 11 um, missions and when he was kind of questioned he said that um, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin actually went to the moon because he had sold a piece of land to them and they were going to check out their plot. 
Um, so you see all sorts of really weird kind of uh, uh, narratives around his ownership of the moon, and obviously these are totally fictional, but they are kind of symbolic in a way as well about our fascination of ownership as well, that, that we really think and that people actually buy uh, these, these title deeds, and you do get a piece of paper which is absolutely meaningless, but some people actually will believe that they have bought a piece of land on, on the moon. But a bit more serious um, around this idea of, of um, development and um, colonization is uh, nicely uh, um, uh, captured by a quote here from Stephen Hawkins, who really believes, and that, that sort of links what I said before, that our long-term um, survival of the human race is really at risk. Um, and that sooner or later that we might have to um, um, establish an independent colony um, anywhere um, else but, but, but the earth in terms for us as a society to, um, to survive and that we have to actually have to go to, to another star. So this is a bit more kind of a serious um, drive behind this idea that we have to expand um, in terms of, 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 of us surviving because of all um, the environmental damage that we have done to our planet, but also because of, of, of resource scarcity. So it's this idea that if we want to keep growing as a, as a society, as an economy, uh, we might become dependent on uh, resources um, from, for example, um, Mars. Um, and obviously this, this kind of thinking has actually sparked um, this idea that, we, um, that we're now going into what is called the kind of third era of space exploration and it is commercial um, exploitation and commercial um, flights into outer space. But I must say, although we obviously see that it's definitely ramping up that we see that commercial enterprises are developing all, all the technology uh, and the material to go into outer space and are launching rockets successfully, etc. But um, even during um, the Cold War era and when we had the first and the second kind of uh, space race, a lot of, of, um, of the developments then were actually also funded by uh, private enterprises. Although we have this idea that it was really run by um, governments and particularly the two great powers, the United States and the Soviet Union, uh, or the USSR at that time, um, it's um, a lot, um, a, a lot of private money went went into it as well. But it's definitely for sure that we now see a huge acceleration where we see uh, commercial exploitation and private enterprises really uh, um, stepping it up and, um, and, and really trying to be part of this new development of, of mining resources um, uh, in terms for us here to continue with, with our growth. And often there is an idea when I, I speak to, to uh, space scientists and I often get the impression that tourism plays a really big role here as well because that might make the technology more affordable if we develop this, this tourism further. Uh, so tourism does, does play a role um, in this as well. And there are so many examples of, and this is again what we read in the newspaper on, on a regular basis, of these private uh, entrepreneurial um, developments. Uh, SpaceX is, is, is one uh, example. But also this one, uh, the Moon Express, is actually a really very good example um, where we really see that they want to be the first commercial company landing um, on the moon um, and it's part of this Lunar X Prize, some of you might have heard, where the company um, who can go first to the moon will get a big prize and the idea is that this would happen by the end of 2017. That will happen, I sort of leave that in the middle and, and up to um, some of you might be uh, more technology savvy than I am to, to see if there is any relevance be, behind it, but it, 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 could, it could be feasible. But this, is, this whole commercial exploitation throws up a lot of questions around, um, um, around how we're going to regulate and how, what kind of mechanisms do we have in place to regulate this new space age. And this is why um, this Moon Express is such an interesting um, example because um, 
as part of, of, of their drive to be the first in, um, in as a first commercial company to land uh, on the moon, um, they needed to have the um, permission and the back of, of um, a national country and the American um, Space Renaissance Act uh, is actually the first um, national legislation allowing um, ownership of resources. And I will go deeper into, into the details um, in a minute. Um, so this is we see that the whole kind of commercialization of, of, of going into outer space for resource development has brought um, a whole new um, era of, 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 of legal, a whole new range of legal kind of questions that we need to ask ourselves and, and it's, 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 it has to go in parallel with developments of, of new uh, legislation of which the United States was um, one of, of the first. But also surprisingly maybe uh, to some of you, Luxembourg is um, the second country that has actually passed, is in the process of passing legislation to allow ownership of resources that are mined um, on, on the moon. Uh, it's not yet uh, passed fully through Parliament, but that could be any moment now, and they hope to get it through uh, Parliament uh, by the end of, um, of um, this, this month. So what, what do we have to make of these of these legislation? Um, and obviously they are controversial, but I just would like to highlight a few things first before we, before we go into the controversy and what's going on here, um, what's what's happening here. So this 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 whole commercial exploration um, and the new legislation that has been passed in in the U.S. and um, Luxembourg is part of this kind of libertarian thinking um, that, and this is, goes back to what I said at the start of my talk, this, this kind of resource frontier thinking that we feel like we have the right to, to develop, we have the right to go there, we have the right to, um, to start exploiting these resources and exploring these resources. And it's part of this, this idea that um, it's not just for something that should be led by governments, but that also individuals, individual companies, should have an opportunity um, to do that. So we definitely see that very clearly articulated um, in the um, Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act from the United States from 2015, where it clearly says that a United States citizen engaged in commercial recovery of an asteroid resource or a space resource under this chapter shall be entitled to any asteroid resource or space resource obtained, including to possess, own, transport, use, and sell the asteroid resource or space resource obtained. So a very clear property language that we see here, and it's the kind of same language, the same kind of justification that is being used in this act to own these resources, the, the, the minerals that, for example, that we would be mining, let's say, on Mars, um, that has been used for centuries when we develop, um, when we go into new territories, was used to colonize uh, the Americas, for example, but also to propertize lots of things. Um, if, if we talk about copyright, if we talk about intellectual property rights, any kind of commodity resource that is that is being commercialized, developed, always is, is kind of developed with this kind of same property regime. And it's that kind of property regime that we kind of see embedded here in, 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 in this act as well, that it is that you are entitled to own, to possess it as your um, individual um, ownership. And we see something similar uh, in the um, draft law in, in Luxembourg. And if you can read that draft law, it's quite interesting how they often refer to the legislation in the US as an example. And that's really interesting, I think, to see that you see that <coughs> the United States is still being seen as that, that superpower in, in this kind of space development and you see that Luxembourg is really standing on the shoulders of, of the US making a kind of almost a claim like it's fine what we're doing because the US is doing this as well. So they really constantly refer back to, to the, um, 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 to the um, uh, American Act. Um, 
But what is also interesting is that in the Luxembourg one, for example, we see a specific reference that they are saying what they're doing here is in accordance with international law. And this is where it starts to become really very interesting and uh, goes at the heart of, of the talk. Because as you can imagine, um, not everybody will, um, will, will be happy with this. And we really need to understand this national legislation which allows individual companies going into outer space, start mining, having ownership over these uh, resources. We need to put this in a wider uh, legislative uh, framework and really put it into a broader view of space law. Uh, and there is such a thing, there is a body of space law, um, and that's what I'm going to do for um, the next uh, part of, of, of the talk, is to go deeper into this body of space law and see if there is any tension between what we see around this commercial drive of mining these resources, backed up by these two new legislations, national legislation, how they interact with um, and, and, and how they uh, relate to this broad body of, of space law. They both, both of the uh, national legislations do mention that they have to do this in, in this development of their national legislation, that they have international obligations as well, and that they specify specifically in, 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 the, in the legislation that they feel that they are in accordance with international law. And they do it just <coughs> in such a great detail that you almost become suspicious, you almost kind of give it away that there are issues of, 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 um, of, rel of, of what they're doing, is it, can we question it, is it according to international law. So as you see, we have quite a, a broad uh, range of different uh, space law, and I'm typically going to go into the Outer Space Treaty of 67, and also into the Moon Agreement of 79. Some of the other um, laws are also very uh, relevant, um, but deals with much more kind of um, technical issues like uh, return of astronauts, etc. So, uh, and the liability convention obviously is really very important from an environmental law perspective, but for this talk I'm going to focus on the Outer Space Treaty and the Moon Agreement. And, um, just to, to, to place it in, in, in a historical context, when, as you see from, um, from the Outer Space Treaty, 67, we're really at the height of the kind of uh, space war between US and um, Soviet Union. Um, so we really have to place ourselves in that era of the Cold War to understand what was going on with, um, with, with these laws and to understand um, on the one hand, maybe the frustration we might currently have, but also I think, um, particularly with the Moon Agreement, and I will come to that later, how I think it's actually quite a brave piece of, of, of law, um, but we will come to that later. Um, what's also uh, important to, to mention is um, that a lot of the ideologies um, that were being put forward in, 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 in particularly in the Outer Space Treaty and later also in the Moon Agreement, that they were examples of, um, of an ideology that some resources, some spaces, that we actually should protect those for, in the language of that era, mankind, um, gender neutral language was, was not on the agenda yet. Um, but there, there was very much that um, part of that thinking was that some, the, they were really questioning, and this is part of the whole kind of Cold War era as well, uh, the, the last thing that America wanted was that the Russians would get their hands onto something, and so it, it's, it's part of, of these two superpowers um, really trying to prevent, A, that outer space would be used um, as part of warfare, but also um, whoever would, would be the one first claiming it uh, would, would be the uh, superpower. So it was trying to keep each other in a check and balances on, on each other. But there is also a wider, maybe, um, a wider ideology behind it, and that's something that we also see um, around the deep sea bed, uh, this idea that it should be part uh, of, of, as a common heritage principle, it should be, should be to the benefit of, of, of humankind. And we also see it with the uh, Antarctica, this idea that that space 
could be developed for scientific purposes, but again for the benefit of humankind. And these kind of ideas are also resonating with what we, what we see um, with space law. So going first into the Outer Space uh, <coughs> Treaty, and keep in mind that the question that we're asking ourselves here is, are these two legislation, is commercial mining of um, resources, is that in accordance to international law? Does the Outer Space Treaty give us any guidance to, 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 to decide what the UN, I'm sorry, what the United States and, and, and Luxembourg if they have been in breach of international law. And this is where the story becomes quite uh, complex, but also fascinating at the same time. So if we look into uh, Article 1, um, we see a very clear language that um, the exploration and use of outer space shall be carried out for the benefit and in the interest of all uh, countries, um, and shall be a province of, of mankind. Um, but then it also says and that the um, outer space, including the moon, uh, shall be free of exploration and use by all states without discrimination of any kind. So this is a, a this causes a lot of, 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 of debate. Um, but then if we look into Article 2, we see that um, a very clear message here that outer space, including the moon, uh, cannot be subject to any national appropriation by claim of sovereignty. So Article 2 is crystal clear. Not one state could claim ownership, could plant their flag on the moon and say, this is mine. Their sovereignty does not extend into uh, outer space, does not extend uh, onto the moon. So that is very clear. There's huge clarity in the Outer Space Treaty here. But that is about ownership of the moon, the Mars, etc. What about the resources? And this is where the commercial use of resources, the Outer Space Treaty, is heavily debated by different commentators, legal commentators, but also as you can imagine, these commercial enterprises are trying to find ways of, make, of, of making a claim that actually the Outer Space Treaty has not specifically forbidden that commercial exploitation of the resources of minerals, for example, is, is forbidden. And they refer to this um, second part of Article 1, that um, outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, shall be free for exploration. They use that particular kind of, 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 um, of sentence wording uh, and, and use um, as, as the, giving the legitimacy to uh, allow um, private enterprises to start mining and to have ownership over um, the minerals. So um, heavily um, debated, and it all depends on how you want to interpret the Outer Space Treaty. And this is where it becomes fascinating and frustrating at the same time. So a lot of people, a lot of legal commentators um, will say that the prohibition in Article 2 actually extends to resources. Um, Others will say, no, it does not extend to, to, to resources. It is only about the ownership of the, 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 the surface itself. Uh, but it does not extend to the minerals we want to mine, for example. And I have a whole range of, of, of arguments uh, at the ready um, to say that their interpretation, uh, which is obviously a, a less stringent interpretation of the Outer Space Treaty, and they're referred to rights to, to use the resource. For them, it's a clear language that they are allowed to use these resources. Otherwise, it would have been specifically mentioned uh, in a more clear kind of language. They also say that a commercial use of, um, <coughs> of outer space is actually not inconsistent with the spirit of the treaty, which I find very debatable because at that time when they were negotiating about the treaty, commercial use was absolutely not on, on, on the table. And I went through some of the historical records and I really struggled to see any kind of guidance in, in that direction. Um, others refer to the high seas regime, which although cannot be owned, but fishing is allowed in the high seas, so hence uh, mining minerals would also be allowed. Um, so there's all, all sorts of, 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 of things that you can find in these negotiations. It's absolutely fascinating to go through all these historical documents and then see how different legal commentators come out with very different kind of conclusions of what the Outer Space Treaty is actually saying um, or not. 
So the Outer Space Treaty is, is um, really not helpful in the sense that its language has not been clear enough. And obviously that is, again, that's why I sort of said this is why we have to get into the kind of Cold War era to understand why maybe the language is very um, soft and hidden in a way. Which is different if we go into the Moon Agreement. Um, but as you may have seen on the other slide, the Moon Agreement has not been ratified by a lot of countries. Um, only 17 up to date, and none of the main spacefaring uh, countries are actually um, um, have ratified. So it's what we would say a kind of toothless uh, instrument um, in that sense. But the language there is much more clear, much more direct, and um, much easier to um, uh, to understand what the spirit actually of space law actually is all uh, all about. And in that sense still has some value as well, um, because we, we see a much clearer message. So for example, this province of mankind, again, in the Outer Space Treaty, has been interpreted in many different kind of ways, but in the Moon Agreement we see a very uh, clear reference to this common heritage of mankind, which we've also seen in the Antarctica Treaty, which we've seen in the, um, in the Unclos of the Sea. <coughs> it belongs to and it's to to humankind. It's for the betterment of humankind. So it's 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 a much clearer kind of reference uh, than in the Outer Space Treaty. Um, again, this kind of uh, prohibition of sovereignty is very clearly uh, mentioned. And then it goes um, further, where we have this unclarity in the Outer Space Treaty. It does mention that. Um, it can establish or the, um, facilitate the establishment of an international regime to govern the exploitation of the natural resources. So the Moon Agreement says, okay, you can actually do, do mine these resources, but again, very much in parallel what we see with the law of the sea, if that is going to happen, we need to have an international regime in place that will govern this, this, this mining, and that is not for the benefit of the company that's going to exploit um, the resources, but for the benefit of humankind. So we really see here very clear guidance um, on how that has to be done, linking to some of the research that Elisa is doing a lot in, um, uh, in her um, project on equitable sharing of, of benefits. Uh, so there's some clear steps written into the Moon Agreement, how to do this, how to come to this equitable sharing of, um, of the benefits. So we see that the Moon Agreement uh, has a much stronger kind of language that really kind of is, is, is making it very clear that this very strict individualistic unilateral vision of exploiting these resources would be in breach of the Moon Agreement. But we have the problem that it's not been ratified, um, and um, and hence has no has no no leverage. But um, nevertheless, um, you see that a lot of um, legal commentators, and particularly in, in 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 Europe, are saying it's still spirit. It's still part of, of it's still spirit of of, of of space law. So even though the United States might not have signed and ratified it, um, they were part of this negotiation, it's still part of this body of space law, and it still gives us um, a wider insight into um, the ideology that is driving space law, which I think, um, and I say this in a very kind of soft and gentle kind of way, um, that we could say that it is very debatable that the legislation that has been passed by the US and, and Luxembourg, to what extent um, that is in, the, 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 there is a case to be made that that has been in breach with um, international um, obligations. But there will be other um, people arguing the opposite for precisely the reasons uh, that I've mentioned. So it's very, very debatable. So we're dealing here with quite an interesting um, dilemma here um, with, 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 with space law. Um, um, and at this point in, in, in the talk, it's interesting to, um, to make a link to science fiction literature. And um, 
because we see that the language is not very clear in, in, in space law. And what I've tried to do in my research is try to get an understanding why are we dealing, um, and it's not, it's not unique, there's other international agreements and treaties that are not, that do not have a very clear language, but this one is particularly uh, interesting. So I've tried to get an understanding why the language is so, um, so unclear in the Outer Space Treaty and what is going on. And this is where making a link with science, uh, science fiction literature and <coughs> studying space law from a methodology that would be used in literature studies becomes really um, interesting. And we see that if you want to understand this image and the foundation of space law, we really need to put it in its particular um, uh, era. And um, what is interesting is that uh, what was really the big kind of, and pardon the pun, the spark for, for, um, um, for the Outer Space Treaty and the negotiations was actually the Sputnik um, crisis. That was a real defining moment in, in the sort of foundation of space law. <coughs> and this is interesting to kind of analyze through science fiction uh, literature. So, up until now, we, I've sort of been talking about um, going into outer space, going to the moon, going to Mars, etc. From this idea that it, it gives us a kind of an utopia. It allows us to maybe experiment with other governance regimes. It, it allows us to, to, um, to use technology to the betterment of, of humankind. And that was very much the idea of, 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 of these initial um, explorations between when the Soviet Union and um, uh, America went into outer space. But then suddenly when Sputnik um, um, arrived on the scene, uh, this whole utopian idea of going into that next frontier became a bit of a, a, a dystopia uh, with the idea that these satellites could actually follow um, every movement. And it's sort of, in social science, we use this idea of a panopticon that you be constantly becoming observed. So suddenly this idea that we could go into space um, as an utopian kind of experiment got this kind of dystopian, nightmarish um, um, side effect in a way through, the, through Sputnik, through having satellites that could observe every uh, movement. So we see that the foundation of space law, on the one hand there was this utopian kind of thinking, that law should um, really um, develop further these, these, these technological developments going into space. But on the other hand, there was also this fear, there was a terror that we couldn't go too far with it as well because it could, this utopia could very quickly <coughs> become um, a dystopia. And this is something um, um, that we see all along in, in science fiction literature, and, and it's not science fiction literature, and if you go into these historical negotiations, if you look into who negotiated um, the, the Outer Space Treaty, for example, a lot of them had dealings with, obviously, with the space industry, a lot of them were science fiction writers as well. So that relationship between space law and science fiction is actually, it's a very close marriage, um, which makes it really fascinating to, to study. And we see all along, um, if we look into science fiction literature from a kind of genealogical perspective and different eras in, in science fiction literature, there are some parallels with debates around where space law is going to go next. So very quickly I go into three um, different um, eras of science fiction literature, often being referred to as the golden age science fiction, so this is around the 50s, 60s. And what is interesting, um, those of you who are science fiction uh, lovers will definitely recognize a lot of these uh, titles. But what is interesting again is that we see this idea of how we're going to conquer, um, let's say, um, the moon. We, we see a change in that genealogy as well if, if we go through different science fiction literature. So when we look into Heinen, for example, it's very much based on a kind of imperialistic kind of thing. We're going to, to conquer, we're going to, to own, we're going to do good, and, and it's very much um, a kind of um, 
Um, yeah, it, 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 it's got a lot of similarities with, with the kind of language that we see in terms of going into the Wild West and that kind of frontier um, thinking. Um, if we move into the next phase of, of this kind of what's often called astrofuturism, this, this kind of genealogy of different science fiction literature, uh, Ben Bova, um, so this is um, after um, the Apollo missions, that's been a real kind of game changer in terms of science fiction literature as well, and how we started to engage with our kind of critical thinking around outer space and, and, and the relationship with Earth. And I'm sure you've seen all many, many pictures of the, 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 the blue planet, you know, um, that was taken. And that was the first time that I think we as, as a human society were aware of our, how fragile we were. We looked very fragile uh, in, that, in that picture. And that was kind of um, also reflected in, um, in all sorts of um, uh, documents and um, um, uh, ideologies as well about how, how are we going to how are we going to deal with with, with, with our sort of fragile environment and um, how are we going to reduce the growth how are we going to be a bit more ethical about how we going um, about our resources and we also see that reflected in in the science fiction literature um, where it kind of coincides with a lot of kind of social movements. Uh, black consciousness movement, um, um, gender equality, feminism, etc. And a really good example of this kind of change in relation to how we're going to go into outer space, develop it, etc. is Ben Bova's uh, return to Mars, where you actually see that the two protagonists, uh, they've got a mixed racial background, there is a native Indian involved uh, as well, and, and um, they try to kind of go into outer space, start to colonize um, uh, Mars in a much more kind of ethical way by bringing in some of these characters with, with, with uh, the, the feminist ideas, with native, um, uh, um, native uh, Indians being part of, of, of the whole endeavor of going into, into outer space. But it's still, it's still very much of um, conquering and, and, um, and, and um, the underlying message has actually not that changed that much. But the radical change comes uh, with the work of Kim Stanley Robinson, um, who, um, whose work is absolutely amazing uh, in terms of questioning on a lot of uh, the, sci the sciences, the technology, but also the governance structures. <coughs> He really understands that if we, if, and he, he, he's very scientific in his writing as well, so he goes into the whole kind of deficit of this planet and that we might have to go to, um, to Mars, but that we cannot make the same mistakes again and that we have to have different, um, different governance regimes um, in place. Um, and he's actually, there is a lot of, um, of, of Earth history embedded in, in his work, but often with a different kind of outcome, and he kind of revisits a lot of our history in, um, in his work. Um, but what is also very interesting is that he comes up with, with, a new, um, with a new declaration, how we actually have to live, how we actually have to develop this new colony um, on Mars. And, and this is really interesting and fascinating to study with some of the <coughs> the articles that is in the Dorsa Brevia Declaration, which are things that really um, sparked a lot of um, questions and, and but also a lot of parallels with maybe some of the environmental uh, laws and regulations we're talking about here. Um, so it's really fascinating to see how he brings this idea of, of terraforming, of forming a colony on Mars to a much different kind of level um, and, and issues that he is discussing in his declaration are actually not part of the Outer Space Treaty, not part of the Moon Agreement. It's really going, this whole idea of taking care of, of, of nature and non-human rights um, is, is very much part of, of um, Kim, Stanley, um, Kim Stanley Robinson's um, work. And just um, 
what is also interesting, um, other work that I'm doing is on rights of nature and earth jurisprudence, and you actually see a lot of synergies in how we think, uh, how within environmental philosophy, environmental law, how we think about how non-humans uh, should get rights and that relationship between humans, non-humans, is actually also part of this 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 um, Dorsa Bravia Declaration as well. So you can really see an interesting debate going on between environmental law on the one hand and um, and science fiction literature. So what to end? So what will the future kind of bring? I think in terms of the mining activities, it's clear that we need to develop this kind of international uh, regime along the lines of the Moon Agreement, and that's what I sort of said at the start of the talk. There is there is. It's actually a very cutting-edge agreement, I think, and um, there is a lot of, 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 of basic principles there that could form a good basis to, to start from, although there are still a lot of kind of questions around how sharing of the benefits will be regulated. A lot of nations really might object that the UN um, should, should be given the authority um, to establish this, this international regime in the United States might definitely be, uh, be a nation that might object to that. Still a lot of questions around how you're going to interpret work with this common heritage principle, but there's, there's something to work from. But I think in terms of the settlements, if you would be actually start to form and colonize um, outer space, I think there we've got a huge, um, a huge battle, a huge um, backlog of, of, of all sorts of, of legal questions that we have to ask first on Earth before we can actually take them into outer space. And I'm just thinking, for example, the whole relationship between humans, non-humans, um, questions around freedom, autonomy, uh, robots, uh, artificial intelligence, data, all of these issues that the law has not yet engage with to, to, to a successful great extent here on Earth, let alone that these issues will kind of multiply, become more complex if we take them to, to outer space. So I think in terms of this, the body of space all that we have, in terms of this colonization and settlement, we're nowhere, we're absolutely nowhere. And this is where I think that some of the science fiction literature can be inspirational for lawyers to, to give us ideas of, of what we can do. And, 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 and to really set up um, that, um, um, that debate.